Hello everyone, and welcome to Introduction to R. In this lesson, we're going to be covering decision trees and how to create decision tree models in R. So in the last lesson, we introduced logistic regression as a predictive modeling technique for classification tasks. While logistic regression can serve as a low variance baseline model, other models often yield better predictive performance. Decision trees are another relatively simple classification model that have more expressive power than logistic regression and can become pretty complex depending on how you end up building them. So if you've ever had to diagnose a problem with an appliance, a car, or a computer, there's a good chance you've encountered something like a troubleshooting flowchart. A flowchart is a kind of tree-like structure with a bunch of yes or no questions that guides you through some process based on your specific situation. So de decision tree models are very similar to that. They're essentially a flowchart for deciding how to classify an observation. So you have a series of yes or no questions or if else style decisions that ultimately assign each observation a certain class or probability of a class at the very end. And that series of yes or no decisions can be depicted as a series of branches that ultimately leads to decision nodes at the end of the tree or bottom of the tree known as the leaves. So we're going to take a look at how to build a decision tree like this for a predictive model in R using the Titanic disaster training data set that we've been using in past lessons. So this first code cell I'm running is just going to load the data and necessary packages. And we're also going to load in the R part package. That's what we're going to use to create decision trees. So we'll show how we're going to do this. We're going to load in R part with library R part. We're also going to load in a R part dot plot package. This will allow us to make a plot of our decision tree so we can visualize what it looks like. Um, this is just setting options for the plot. And now to create a decision tree model using the R part package, we just have to essentially pass in a formula just like we did for linear regression and logistic regression, where the first variable is what we want to explain or predict. And then everything coming after the tilde is going to be our explanatory variables. So for a simple example, we're going to make one that's predicting survival just with the sex column in the Titanic disaster training data. So we're going to call our, the R part function. Our thing we're predicting is survived that column, then tilde, and then everything after that is the variables we're predicting with. In this case, it's going to be the sex column. And then the next argument is just our data set. So our data is going to equal Titanic train. That's what we call the data set. So when we run this, a decision tree model will be created and stored in this gender tree variable here. And then we can use this function we loaded in with the rpart.plot library called PRP. This will create a visualization of the resulting tree. So to do that, we take the model that we saved and then we call PRP. We pass that model, the tree model into that. And then we can specify some other parameters too. These are just essentially formatting the plot so that it looks nicer in the window here. So when we run this, we will train in a decision tree model and then view what it looks like with a visualization here. So when I scroll down, we can look at it. So essentially, we created a model with only one decision node. There was one yes or no question. Is the sex of the passenger equal to male? Yes or no? And if it's yes, things are routed into this leaf and a decision is made. So in this case, it's saying, if you are a male, yes, then your probability of being in the survived class is 19%. And if it's no, then your probability of being in that class is 74%. So basically what that's telling us is males, yes, had a low predicted survival probability and the females, where male was no basically, had a 74% survival probability. Now this resulting decision tree here is about the simplest decision tree model you can have. All it has is one decision, but decision trees can be built 
with more variables and more branches, and they can potentially get extremely complicated depending on how many variables you're using and how deep you let the tree grow. So we'll give an example of a somewhat more complicated model where we will essentially do the same thing but add one more variable. So we're going to call our part again with survived and sex, but we're just going to say plus P class. So we're going to add the passenger class. That's the only difference we're going to make here. And then we'll run it and remake the plot. And let's see how much different it looks here. So we'll run that and we can see now we have a new decision tree that has a whole extra level here. So we have our the first decision is actually the same question, male, yes or no. But then each of those branches has their own branch where it's saying, is the person class three? And if yes, then this is their predicted survival probability. So for not male, third class, 50% survival. So that basically saying females that are in third class had were predicted to have that survival rate. Females that were higher than third class, so better than third class, had a 95% survival prediction. So this is a slightly more complicated decision tree model, but it still only has two levels here and four terminal nodes or leaves. But you can imagine that if you keep extending this out with every new level the tree has, the number of leaf nodes doubles. So on this first level, there's only two, but then there's four. And if we had a third level here, there'd be eight and so on. So if you let the tree get pretty deep, you can end up getting an extremely large number of leaves because it's an exponential growth of the number of leaves for each level. So I'll give an example of how big the tree can kind of grow if you add some more variables and don't control the depth. We're not gonna go too crazy here, but we're gonna grow something that's going to be pretty big. So we're just going to rerun our same model again and just add a few more variables to it. So we're going to have survived p class and sex again but we're just going to add passenger age the fare they paid where they embarked from and if how many siblings they had and we're also going to set a different complexity parameter this influences whether the tree decides to keep growing branches or not and if we set this low it will allow the model to grow a more complex tree so we're just setting this low so that we can see an example of the tree kind of growing a lot and we'll run this and rerun the plot here the plot size is going to be a bit, bit bigger because this is a more complicated tree i might have to end up zooming out for this but let's run it and see what we get so you can see here we ended up with a tree that has a lot more decisions and <laughs> Here, let me zoom out because it's pretty deep. It's hard to even zoom out to see the whole thing. But essentially, we have a decision at the very top, which is which still happens to be the same decision. It's sex, male or female, yes or no. But then below that, there's all kinds of other questions like what's your age? What's your P class? What's your age again? What's the fare you paid? And the depth of this tree is something like one, two, three, four, five, six. This is an over 10 depth tree. So there's lots of decisions being made here, a ton of terminal nodes at different levels of the tree. So this can allow a model to predict many different categories or pr probabilities for your task. But it also means that your model can be prone to overfitting because if you can grow something with enough nodes in it, you can essentially make a model that will remember every single possibility in your entire data set. This tree isn't big enough to do that, but just imagine you had a data set with say 500 points you're trying to predict, and then you grew a tree with 500 terminal nodes. Well, that tree would be able to perfectly predict every single point you're dealing with because there'd be a different prediction node for every single thing you're trying to deal with. And when you get models that are starting to get that large, you can end up really overfitting your training data, and then it tends not to generalize well to new data or the test data set. So one way we can constrain the complexity of our decision tree is by using arguments to the decision tree function itself that allows it to be constrained. So I'll give an example of how we can do that here by limiting the depth of the tree. So we're going to rerun the same model we just did with the same variables, 
but we're going to add some extra arguments that will constrain its complexity. So we're actually going to keep the complexity parameter the same, but we're going to limit it to a max depth of five. So it can only grow to a depth of five. And we know that before it grew much deeper than that. And we're also going to say min bucket equals five. That means the minimum number of observations in leaf nodes is going to be five. That will prevent the model from doing what I was describing, having leaf nodes associated with only a couple predictions, which is generally not something that you want to do if you want to avoid overfitting. So just by adding these two different parameters here to our function will greatly constrain the complexity of the tree. And we should maybe end up with something that looks a little bit more reasonable. So I will run this one and pull down to the plot. So you can see that we have a model that's a bit more complicated than the simpler ones because we have a lot more variables in it. But you can see that there's a lot fewer nodes than there were in the big model, and it did limit the depth to five. But it seems quite a bit more reasonable because we really only have, what, three, six, 10 decision nodes. And when we're dealing with a data set where we're making, say, 700 predictions, 10 decision points isn't too many. So we wouldn't be super concerned about a model like this overfitting to the data. So to wrap up for this lesson, decision trees are an easily interpretable yet surprisingly expressive form of predictive model. A decision tree of limited depth can provide a good starting point or baseline for classification tasks, and model complexity is easily adjustable. Now it should also be noted that decision tree models can be used for regression tasks in addition to classification, but I find it's easier and more intuitive to think about them in terms of classification. Now for our final lesson in this guide, we're going to learn about random forest models, which are an extension of decision trees that tend to perform a bit better and pretty well on a wide variety of different classification and regression tasks. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.